before coming to Metro. She's a Denver RTD person where she um, worked on the, the Flatiron Bus Rocker Transit Project which had a 40% ridership growth in the quarter. And she's also involved in the American Public Transit Association. So without our next Nadine is coming on, she's also a professional engineer. And so here is Nadine. Wait, welcome. Today, so I decided that I would talk about the things that I care about the most, which are things that are in the Metro Vision 2020 <coughs> strategic plan, and the things that probably you don't hear about all that often, but are things that are hugely important for transportation and mobility here in LA County. And even though this is the Transit Coalition, I think it's really important for um, for us to often talk about how transit fits into the bigger overall picture of transportation in LA County, particularly because every piece has to work together in, a, in order for people to move. So um, so the first thing is that uh, the Metro Board of Directors passed Vision 2028 in June of last year, so it's almost been a year. Um, you know, you're starting to hear more mention of it, and there's a, there are a lot more associations to the strategic plan, but I think a lot of times we sort of forget to tell people what we're talking about. And we certainly don't get out in public and talk about it that much unless it's me talking. Um, so, the first couple slides here, you guys know all of this stuff already because you already have been around Metro for a long time. Um, you know, we do everything related to transportation, that's basically what this says. Um, and then this, just, this slide just kind of gives you a perspective of what Metro does, the magnitude of the work that we have in front of us. And remember that Metro is only one component of the regional trans transit system, regional, regional transportation system, and we have a number of muni operators. Um, we have city DOTs, we have all kinds of people contributing in some form to our transportation system. And so in, I think in our strategic plan, we've referred to it as a, as a patchwork of different providers and a patchwork of different uh, modes and options and things like that. And so if you can imagine uh, the lived experience that everyone has, it's a little bit disparate and sometimes dysfunctional. So, um, so the whole purpose of the strategic plan was to pull everything together. So the reason that we started this is because there was a UCLA study that basically said we had 2.3 million new residents in the last 15 years, and with that came 2.1 million cars. And this pattern is really unsustainable. And we've talked about sustainability for a long time, but we have failed miserably to figure out how to accommodate this type of growth. Even though we're a huge <coughs> economic powerhouse, and we really do want to grow and want people to prosper and do all these great things with their life. So if we're going to add another million people in the next 10 years, how are we going to accommodate all those trips? And so um, you know, we have all these things happening, right? We have um, the Olympics are coming in 2028. That's only 10 years away. Um, you know, Measure M passed in 2016, which builds a ton of infrastructure. Uh, we have all kinds of development going on in the region. You know, downtown is having this third revival, or whatever they want to call it. <laughs> Uh, and I'm just as guilty because I just bought a condo in downtown. Um, and then there are all these other things that are happening, like technology is changing. And so all these opportunities are before us, which we <coughs> never contemplated five, even five or ten years ago. Um, we have great political leadership right now. Uh, there's just everything sort of ready for a change, right? And so when I came to LA three years ago, that's kind of what I saw as the trend. And so that's what brought me to LA. And I'm, I'm super excited to be here. Um, I sort of joked with everybody that, um, you know, once I was done with Vision 2028, I fulfilled my goal and I can leave. But I was sort of kidding because uh, we still have to implement the thing. Um, so here's, here's our problem. Um, we have this huge <laughs> travel demand. And that is not going to stop in the next 10 years. And so somehow we have to figure out how to accommodate all of these trips on a system that's already at capacity. I mean, you guys drive every day, or not every day maybe, but I mean, you've driven on our system today, and, and you know that there's congestion at any given time of the day on any day of the week. And so 
how, how are we going to, I mean, we're not going to tell people to stop traveling, right? What we want people to do is travel, live their lives, do all these great things, um, but we want them to do it in a more mindful way. And the only way to do that is to find ways to accommodate those trips in a more efficient and effective way. And so, so this is our problem statement, and it's something that, that we don't talk a lot about, because we need to really get people to understand that we have this, you know, this capacity issue. Um, and so it's not just about how many people are driving or how many people are taking transit. The whole collective system has to work for everyone. So our root cause here is that we're, we're really using our, uh, our system capacity very inefficiently. And there are a lot of reasons for that. And, and the other piece that we're trying to help people understand is that um, you know, there are a lot of different ways to attack our problem. There isn't a panacea, and everybody seems to think that, oh, if you just build more infrastructure, that's going to solve the problem, or, oh, if you just, you know, provide more service, it's going to solve the problem, and that's not really true. We have to hit it at every angle in order to make these things work. So again, Vision 2028 was designed to get people to start thinking about all the different pieces that have to work together in order for us to change the way we move. So, uh, this is going to seem like really obvious stuff to everybody here in this room, but the whole idea here was that we really wanted to reduce the reliance on a single occupant vehicle. You know, if you're riding around with multiple people in your car, we don't have a problem with that. Um, it's really the person who's driving alone. And by the way, if you're <coughs> driving alone or if you have an Uber driver driving just you, that's the same thing. So, um, you know, the advent of Uber has actually added problems to congestion because we're, we're continuing to just have people riding around with really just one, one person, you know, the trip is really just for the one person. And so, you know, we've added congestion because of the advent of Uber and Lyft. Um, so we really want to, um, we really want to improve mobility across the county, and that's for everybody, because everybody deserves to have good transportation, no matter who you are, no matter where you live, no matter what your income level is, um, whatever. We want everybody to have an opportunity for a better life. And so, um, as I was mentioning before, Metro Vision 2028 is um, designed to bring all of that together. This isn't your grandpa's strategic plan. <laughs> it's not for the faint of heart. It's very difficult. If you actually look at the document, if you read the entire thing from cover to cover, you should really do that five times because there's a, it's really information dense and there's a lot in there that's pretty overwhelming. Um, but we're willing to take it on. We think that we're actually going to be able to accomplish this. Um, we have a lot of unprecedented approaches in the plan. Um, I joke sometimes that some of those things are going to get us fired, uh, but that doesn't mean they're not worth doing. And so Vision 2028 is our guidepost, and everything that we do over the next 10 years is going to be dictated by what's in that plan. Here's our vision. Um, you know, we want to remove mobility barriers to increase access to opportunity. Uh, we want to make travel fast and convenient for everyone, no matter what time of day they're traveling or where they're trying to go. And we want to provide the highest and best use of our existing capacity so that we can accommodate more trips. It seems pretty simple, uh, philosophically, but I know it's very hard to do because we don't do it now. Um, but we thought about what outcomes we want to achieve in order to, uh, to fulfill our vision. And so, some of the outcomes that we define in the plan are, you know, providing access to high quality mobility options within a 10 minute walk from your destination or, or your origin. Um, we want, it to, we want to uh, decrease wait times to a maximum of 15 minutes. And we want buses generally to go faster. And we want to give people options to bypass congestion. And we were pretty broad and, and high level in, in describing that. We didn't want to we didn't want to prescribe what that what that solution would look like. The goals that we had for Vision 2028 um, they focus on services, customers, communities, partnerships, and of course our own organization. So let me go through those goals really quick. Um, goal one is about new capacity, and it's about existing capacity, and it's about travel demand. So. The first thing is um, on new capacity, we really need to target investments in new capacity to the areas that most need it. And our theory here is that people who have transit as their only option, that option should be the best it could possibly be. And so those investments have to be given to the, the people who need it the most. Um, 
I have this great quote that I like to say um, that Franklin D. Roosevelt said, and he said, the test of our progress is not whether we add more to the abundance of those who have much, it is whether we provide enough for those who have too little. And that's the philosophy behind um, what, how we look at our investments. Um, of course, we're talking about Measure M. Everybody knows about it, Measure M. Um, that's all new infrastructure, so new capacity. Um, and then in terms of the quality of the existing capacity, we have a whole section of where we talk about what we call world-class world bus. And that's really leveraging the, um, the power of our bus system because we have 70% of our riders riding bus today. And we need to improve that system and make that a more efficient and effective system for them so that they can take more trips and more people can make more trips on the bus. Um, we also want to talk about asset management and the importance of maintaining our assets so that you know, like a little capital investment can go a long way in terms of saving money from year to year on our operating and maintenance expenses. Um, and then the third piece of goal one was really managing demand, and I'll get it, get more into congestion pricing and things like that, but really managing the demand on our street capacity and how we're going to, how we're going to encourage more ride sharing so that we use our space more efficiently. So really this, um, this first goal is about leveraging our influence to you know, cajole and incentivize practices that will actually help us achieve these goals. The second goal in uh, Vision 2028 is about uh, creating a better customer experience. Um, you know, we, have, we can provide all the options that we want, but if we give people a really terrible customer experience, we're not really giving them a product they want to buy. And so uh, the big issues that we have to contend with are all the ones you hear about in the news. You know, issues of security, uh, people, people really have a hard time navigating our system, so we call it the legibility of our system, and of course the accuracy of the information that we provide to them. We want to continue to improve that all the time. Um, and really, every interface that we have with a customer should be excellent, and that's the bottom line. In our third goal, uh, we feel that we have an obligation to play a role in stabilizing our communities, partially because we have a huge jobs program, you know, with Measure M, and you know, I mean, how many of you were here because you're doing work with, with Metro or you're hoping to do work with Metro? It's because we're a huge economic generator because of all of our projects. And um, so we want to create jobs. We want to create jobs that have career pathways for people in transportation. Um, we want to leverage all these investments so that we can help stabilize a lot of neighborhoods. So I think our transportation school is going in in South LA. Um, obviously, that was a very strategic move on our part because that's where we can gain a lot of uh, potential uh, industry people for the future. Um, and then, of course, we want to conduct really genuine community engagement for all of our projects. It's not just a here, you know, here's the EIS or the EIR, you know, we're done talking to you. You know, we want to continue to engage people as we develop these projects and implement them. Um, and then we also want to play a leadership role. Um, in this particular goal, we want to play a leadership role in homelessness and addressing homelessness. Um, we talk internally a lot about, and, and Phil Washington may mention this a lot as well, but we talk a lot about leadership voids. Um, the fact that there are a lot of things that people all talk about wanting to do, but nobody's volunteering, nobody's raising their hand to say, I'm going to lead this. And so, you know, for something that touches so many of our, our customers, things like homelessness, you know, somebody's going to have to step into that leadership void. And so we're basically saying we're willing to do that. We're not going to do it forever, but we can get the conversation started. So that's kind of what we're doing now. Um, the fourth goal is about collaboration and working with other people around, around the county. We can't do this alone. Um, I know that a lot of people come to Metro with their hand out all the time, and what we're saying is, what are you going to do to help move this vision forward? What are you going to do to help us reach our goal and fulfill our mission? Um, because everybody plays a role, and it's not just who has the money, it's who has the vision and who, who has the influence. And so we want to work with everybody at the local, state, national levels to accomplish these goals. And that could involve anything from just policy changes to leveraging uh, matching funds from grants. Um, it could be a number of different strategies, but we want to work with other people because, you know, we're not going to, I mean, nobody really, I, I know everybody calls Metro the big girl in the room, but, um, but that's not really the role we want to play. We want to make sure that we're working with others. And then, of course, the fifth goal in Vision 2028 is really about our own internal housekeeping. How are we going to set our organization up? success and so we talk a lot about things like leveraging our resources to achieve our goals in this strategic plan um, you know being accountable you know being a good steward of taxpayer dollars 
um, being transparent, and of course, uh, one of the most important things is applying what we call prudent commercial practices in the course of doing business. And so we talk a lot about leveraging our resources in order to generate revenue so that we can reinvest those revenues in, in our system. So I want to talk a little bit about um, some of the elements that have you know, come to light as a result of a number of different board motions or board actions. Um, the first one is uh, the reimagining of LA County. I know some of you are here to talk about congestion pricing. Um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we do have a vested interest in managing the dem demand on <coughs> highways. Uh, we already have an express toll program, uh, which I think is the, our express lanes program, which is really about um, you know providing an option for people who want a faster trip. Uh, it's, it's a very successful program. We do generate revenue from that. And now we want to take it to the next level and look at the possibility of um, doing either closing pricing or corridor pricing or possibly VMT somewhere in the county. We don't know where it's going to be. We're launching a study to do that. Um, but of course, you know, it's going to take a long time. Like we have a, two, we're planning on a two-year study. Uh, coupled with the technical part of that study is going to be a huge community outreach and, and engagement um, uh, contract, which of course because we can't just go out and do this to the people. So, um, so we want to we make sure that we engage people in that conversation um, so that hopefully we can actually come out with a successful pilot. Um, we do know that there are a number of different examples around the world. Uh, you've probably heard of them in Stockholm, in London, in Singapore. Um, Vienna has not congestion pricing, but they have a pretty uh, solid parking management program within their central business district. All of those things can, you know, can come to light as part of our uh, congestion pricing study. Really, it's about managing the capacity. Um, and then also one of the things that we talked about as part of the reimagining LA County uh, initiative was really looking at the regulation of transportation networking companies. You know, when I mentioned before that people who are one person riding in an Uber or Lyft are not solving our problem, that's kind of what we're talking about. In addition to the fact that Uber and Lyft are making money off of uh, their use of our, our public highways. So, um, so I think it's, it's something for us to explore. I don't know what the outcome is going to be, um, but it, I think it's something that we're going to look at, and if there's an opportunity for us to uh, use our capacity in a more efficient way, um, and there are strategies to do that through pricing or whatever, that's, that's what we're going to try to do. Another thing that we haven't talked about that much, which uh, you guys might think, well, why are we interested in this, is our goods movement strategic plan. We do have a huge section in the Vision 2028 plan to talk about goods movement, and the reason you guys should care about this is because goods movement affects people movement. Um, the two have to interact, particularly in LA County. Um, just a few statistics for you. We're the 10th busiest container port complex in the world and the largest in the US. Um, you know, we have 578 million square feet of warehousing space in the region, 18,000 warehousing buildings, we house 30%, a 30% share of the goods movement um, in California, goods movement dependent industries in California, and we employ through goods movement over 1.3 million people. And so it's a huge economic generator for the region, and, um, and so we're not, we can't kill it in the interest of only moving people, so we have to find a way for the two to coexist. Now, in addition to that, um, it's not just what's happening on the highways or what's happening on the railroad, um, it's also about local delivery because you know, now that everybody's getting their deliveries through Amazon and you have subscriptions to things, you know those local de delivery trucks are impacting um, impacting the space, the curb space um, on the side of the street. But they're also impacting buses, they're impacting bikes, they're impacting all kinds of uh, all kinds of modes that are trying to move on our city streets. And so we need to find a way to manage that as well. Um, so. Goods movement, the strategic plan is actually, um, it's, I think they're just getting it kicked off and it's going to be about a year long study. I mentioned world class bus earlier. Um, again, 70% of our riders are on bus. Um, the buses are using the same streets and suffering from the same congestion that all the other cars are dealing with. So it doesn't seem quite right that a bus that's moving 40 people should be stuck in traffic with the rest of the cars that are carrying only one, pe one person. So, um, so we're going to look at things like piloting bus only lanes and we have the next gen study going on that's looking at the, the actual travel patterns that people have these days and whether or not our bus network, the routes are actually addressing those travel needs. 
And so um, we'll start to see changes um, probably maybe towards the end of this year at the earliest, but it'll be a phased, um, the changes will be phased over time, and so it'll be done with our shakeups. Are you, you're familiar with our shakeups, right? Every six months we change routes and do different things with our service. They call them shakeups here. I can't remember what they called them in Denver, but I didn't realize they were called shakeups here. Um, so, um, you know, the thing, the other thing we want to do with um, World Class Bus is really establish um, this whole idea of customer experience. And that actually goes for bus and rail. Um, it just seems to manifest more in bus on the bus side. But, um, you know, I, I often, I've talked to a lot of people who, who do a lot with customer experience around the world, and they always talk about the customer's hierarchy of needs. And I don't know if you follow Maslow's hierarchy of needs, but um, when you talk about what customers need, they need things like, you know, security, travel time, travel time reliability, um, cleanliness, you know, the basic things. And if you don't address those things, it doesn't matter how much Wi-Fi you put on the bus. You know, you got you to make sure you give them um, all of those, take care of all those really basic foundational things. And then you can add on the things like, you know, painting the bus, you know, a different color or making it look nicer. Um, because unless the bus is reliable, nobody really cares. So, so we are going to talk about, or we are talking about doing this customer service and experience plan that I'm going to talk about next. Um, the whole idea behind that is to establish a really great total journey experience. Um, so, customer experience. Um, this is this is like my baby right now because I'm trying to get this thing to our board in June <laughs> by the end of our fiscal year. Um, it is amazingly difficult to do, but it's it's going to be so groundbreaking for Metro when I get it done. Um, and I do have some people working with me on that, so I always say I because I feel like I'm solely responsible for making sure it gets done. Um, but <laughs> um, the whole point here with our customer journey, which we have illustrated here, is trying to get you where you need to go quickly and easily with no hassle. Okay, how many of you take the bus or the train on a regular basis? Yeah, so I don't really need to explain to you how hassle-free it is right now, right? <laughs> okay, so um, so a lot of what we can do can happen if we integrate new technologies and provide new mobility services to our portfolio. I know he, the, the gentleman in the back mentioned first and last mile, um, particularly, with, particularly with bikes, but of course walking and you know trying to provide better customer experiences overall. Um, connectivity is huge, um, but you know, we have to understand what we're trying to achieve before we go out and try to do it. And so we created <coughs> this illustration because we wanted people within Metro to understand what a smooth customer journey might look like. Um, so we're really trying to avoid this sort of haphazard approach that we've had in the past and really focus people on the end goal, which is how do we make trip planning or trip taking so easy and seamless that nobody has to think about it anymore? That's the dream. Um, so I'm pretty excited about that. But what, our, what we've said in Vision 2028 is that we want to develop this unifying strategy for enhancing the customer experience. And that is what this customer service and experience plan is all about. Um, we are planning to use data and benchmarks to help measure our performance. Um, we have in our customer service and experience plan key performance indicators. Um, we have a series of customer experience projects that were driven by the CEO's uh, ridership initiatives that were implemented or were announced last year. Um, and then, of course, there's the whole piece about transit service marketing and communications and trying to get information to the customer about the journey. Um, and then, of course, the internal aspects, which is the customer experience culture. So what I tell people a lot of times is, what would our organization look like if our entire organization was designed around making the bus or rail operator's life as easy as possible? I and mean, that would completely change how we do business. I mean, if we if we said, okay, we've got to make sure that bus is running smoothly and on time every day, like the bus is available for him, it doesn't break down, you know, and we do all these things to make their life so much easier that, you know, suddenly he can pay attention to the customer, you know, and answer questions or whatever. Like that would be a very different groundbreaking sort of approach to how we do business. Um, and we try to try to separate our customer experience to trip planning and trip taking to simplify. You know, it's not it's no longer like, you know, I gotta fix this budget so that somebody has money to do this one thing, you know, with the app. It's like, you know, we gotta talk about how does how does your ability to deliver the budget 
you know, affect our ability to deliver the app. You know, it's kind of weird. I mean, I don't know. I don't know if you guys follow this sort of thing. I'm, maybe I'm not making sense, but <laughs> um, so anyway. The whole thing about the performance met metrics is, you know, what gets measured gets improved, and so we're trying to establish some key performance indicators that will tell us which things need to be improved, and then start collecting data that will tell us exactly how we're operating so that we can improve those things. And of course, as we start checking those things off the list, and our, our measures start to get better, then we can look at other things that are affecting our ability to de deliver on a better customer experience. So you might ask, um, what kinds of KPIs are we looking at? Well, we have different categories. Um, convenience is one of them. I mean, we need to measure if the service is running as planned or if there's disruptions during the journey. Um, ease of use, which is the customer experience during transfers. How good is our wayfinding? Um, is it working for people? Are we giving people the information they need? Um, you know, do they have information on detours? Do they, can they easily purchase a ticket, which apparently is not very easy right now? Um, the list goes on and on. Um, comfort, of course, includes safety and security. We have safety and security as a separate item just because it's such a big, you know, sort of hot button item. Um, but it includes things like cleanliness and the environmental conditions of your experience in the station or at a bus stop. You know, what's the lighting like? How do you feel when you're out there? What's ventilation like, especially if you're underground? Um, you know, is there shade if you're above ground? Um, things like that. Is there seating for somebody who really can't stand for a long period of time if you're waiting for a bus that only comes half an hour, every half an hour, or hour for that matter? Um, and then of course customer care, uh, which is really using the Zappos model of, you know, how long are we engaging people on the telephone when they call for, you know, for information or have a complaint? Like how complete is the information that we provide to them? Do they need to call back multiple times to get that information correct? So things like that are our focus for our KPIs. And we will always be refining and expanding on these KPIs and looking at our results from our customer satisfaction survey that we'll do on a periodic basis so that we actually know how we're improving from year to year. And then um, customer service and experience projects. Um, these are things like mobility as a service, bus only lanes. Um, you know, trying to uh, improve our, our fair payment mechanisms um, and, and really providing more information to the customer. And so uh, these projects, they're, right now they're sort of disparate um, individual projects, but we pulled them all together into our customer service and experience plans so that we can track them together um, because they all interact with each other. So as we start to finish each of these projects, um, <coughs> they'll, be, they'll sort of retire off that list um, because they'll be in sort of a maintenance mode and then we'll add new projects on. So it'll be a living, breathing document. We'll always have more things that we're adding to it. I mean, if we do this right, we're really never done, right? So, um, so we're going to keep doing additional projects in the area of customer service and experience. Um, in terms of transit service marketing and communications, um, really it's, you know, addressing how Metro is working to improve customer communication on any topic that makes the customer's trip easier. So that's new services, closures, detours, schedule changes. Um, we just want to figure out if there are new ways to engage our customers. Um, nowadays, you can do online surveys. You can ping people through Facebook. Um, of course, we will never give up in-person meetings and things like that, but we'll try to make those more targeted to the populations that aren't able to get online. Um, but you know, we want to make sure that we're engaging people in our conversation. And then, of course, the last piece is the customer experience culture within Metro itself. Um, we want to figure out what training needs we have to help people understand their relationship to the customer, figure out role mapping so that people know how their job relates to the overall customer experience in the end. And really, um, we, we are intending to hire a customer experience strategist also, which is pretty exciting because there aren't that many transit agencies around the country that do that, but uh, I think it's a pretty critical role um, that strategists will be responsible for um, overseeing everything that's in the customer service and experience plan. And, um, and so we're working on that job description right now, and uh, that should be advertised here probably in the next couple of months. Um, so the other thing I will tell you is that this is a continuous improvement process. I don't know how many of you are performance measurement gurus, but um, continuous improvement is not a pass or fail endeavor. Uh, it's something that you start, you start with a benchmark, and then you keep trying. You know, you're going to make a lot of mistakes along the way, but you keep trying, you keep measuring things, 
you keep collecting data, and then ultimately, hopefully, you come to uh, a nice uh, level um, sort of uh, you know routine sort of thing where you always know what you're measuring and, and how to how to fix the problems you have through the measurement um, of certain metrics and, and collecting the data and evaluating the trends within that data. So. Um, this is this is all really super geeky, but um, I love continuous improvement. Um, so yeah, we're gonna um, we're gonna measure, we're gonna evaluate, and course correct as necessary. But the whole idea is that this is a starting point, and uh, we really want to uh, do this continuous improvement process in customer experience so that we can ultimately get to the goal in June 2028. So. The world is really changing. Um, people are making a lot of mobility decisions based on what their lifestyle needs are. And we are gearing up to adapt um, our menu of services to address the lifestyle and travel patterns. And so we're really trying to revolutionize the way we do business. Really, um, at the end of the day, we're really trying to remove barriers so that people don't have to think about their transportation and they can go on living their lives and doing the things that they want to do, you know, quite, you know, finding access to opportunity that they wouldn't otherwise have because of mobility barriers. And so, um, so this is, you know, I think, I think LA County is going to be a really different place in the future, and I'm excited about it because I think that this is a, a new relationship that Metro is going to have with its customers, and I hope that you all will get excited about this too. So thank you. I have to leave now to catch a train is that I live in this remote community that's so far out of touch with public transit called Burbank <laughs> and it's 10 miles away but other than waiting until 9.30 tonight I don't have another train to get home. I've been here since 1980 and I've seen measure A and C and M and R and C and M or R and M all of these promises and as an advocate I'm an optimist but in my heart these days I'm a cynic. Metrolink's been around for 25 years and Metro is a key agency of Metrolink and Metro owns the track from here to Burbank and beyond and yet I don't have a train home unless I leave right now. I'm sorry but you know it's hard to stay optimistic and positive about these things, but I wish you well, but uh, it's just not good enough right now, is it? Nope. Ready? Right? Thank you. Paul. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, um, so I will mention that we did uh, mention Metrolink in the strategic plan because we understand that there is additional capacity on the Metrolink system that could be leveraged. Um, obviously, there are some significant governance and policy issues surrounding that, but um, we're ready to start a conversation about it. Um, but I will also say that, um, you know, of course, if you're following the next gen study at all, um, you probably have heard some of the information coming out about uh, the analysis of the travel patterns and where people are actually trying to go. And I think the average, I'm not gonna, I hope I get this right, but um, the, the average trip length is actually, for most people, for most trips, is actually less than seven and a half miles. A lot of people take local trips within their area or neighborhood, and they're not going much beyond that. Um, so I think, you know, with uh, cell phone data these days, we can get more <coughs> information about how people are traveling so that we can uh, better adapt the system to, to work with their needs. Because um, if it makes more sense for us to do shorter routes within, you know, these sort of limited regions, um, you know, that might be a better use of our revenue service hours. So, um, so I agree with them that you know MetroLink certainly could be leveraged to, uh, for higher and best, better use. But, um, but I will also say that you know if we make investments, um, perhaps in something like an express bus service that can you know run on bus only lanes between say downtown and, and Burbank, perhaps that option might actually work better for him than MetroLink. Um, I think a lot of people think transit and they think rail only, um, but that's partially because the bus system doesn't work as well as it really should. And there are a lot of reasons for that. You know, we don't give priority to buses, and then we spend all of our time complaining about how buses don't work as well as rail, and it's really not a level playing field. So we want to change that paradigm and, and really figure out how we're going to make buses work. Uh, when we were first talking about the strategic plan before we had it written, I would go out and talk to people about leveraging our bus system, and I would say, you know, in my perfect world, we would have a grid of BRT in exclusive lanes all across the county, 
And if you can imagine taking just the Metro Rapid network <coughs> and making that all BRT and work you know, in that grid across the county, can you imagine what that would do for LA County and how mobile you could be without a car? It would be pretty amazing. On that same note, and something that you said that you were passionate about, I know for like myself and a few of the individuals that I've talked to, um, something like a Waze app where people are changing the way that they travel. Not that they need directions, but they just want to know the fastest place, <laughs> fastest way to get to wherever they're going. So I find myself, I know how to get to my parents' house, but I'm going to pull up Waze and say, okay, well, what's the fastest way to get there? And I rely on that to the point now where I think the way people are traveling, they're more reliant on an app to tell them how to get there than their own brain. Um, you take that, <laughs> no. say, say, right? No. Yes. Go ahead. You take that and you apply it to taking that single person out of that vehicle. I know one time where I'm looking to catch the gold line, I want to know how long it's going to take me to walk out of my house and get to a spot in downtown LA in real time. Um, if I could take the bus, I probably would take the bus and rather have to walk all the way to a train station and so on and so forth. So what are the things that you're passionate about in um, not reinventing but improving that experience? The connections part? Yeah. So well Or mobility, I guess that kind of falls into mobility as well too, because I so uh, let me see if, if this will answer your question. Um as I understand it, I, I what I'm most passionate about is leveraging every possible mode to its highest and best use. And that means that in certain instances, um, rail is not going to work for everybody. Um, in fact, I, I always tell people, if you take the map of LA County and you overlay our rail system on that map, you can see that it basically does not come close to most people who live in the county. Um, so then overlay the bus system on top of that and then start overlaying you know, places where we might be able to use smaller demand responsive services like microtransit or mobility on demand like the TNC kind of stuff. Um, when you start to leverage all of those different modes to their highest and best use, applying them where they most make sense, I think you can actually create a system that is, is much more demand responsive for people in general. Um, I mean, we can't make a demand responsive train. That investment doesn't make sense, but we can make that train, the trunk line, that takes people at high speeds for long distances. Um, you know, a, a shuttle service or a rideshare service can be used for those short trips, you know, where people, you know, like it's not worth it for them to wait for 15 minutes for a bus because the trip itself by walking would take you 15 minutes, right? So in certain areas of the county, it doesn't make sense to do, you know, these sort of high capacity, um, uh, you know, fixed route services. Maybe, maybe in some places we just need to do these little shuttle services that, that are running around. It, I, I'm not sure where those things should be applied, but, but we should look at it because we have a lot of tools at our fingertips now that we didn't have before. So we might as well try, but we, we have to know what our end goal is. Our end goal might be, you know, you should be able to get to, you know, a thousand jobs within ten minutes of your, you know, your home or whatever. But that's not true for everybody. So how can how can we do that? How can we make investments where everybody will have that same shared experience? Um, so this is super complicated. I'm not saying that I know all the answers, <laughs> but but I definitely think that there's a possibility here. And I think um, one of the most exciting things about LA County is that. You know, it's LA County. Like nobody believes we can do this, which means when we do it, they're going to be amazed. And so, <laughs> we don't want to let go of our convertibles. <laughs> so uh, I do. So I use my apps also. <laughs> but oh, yeah. By the way, my husband doesn't trust Waze. But <laughs> I tell him you can't use Waze if you're not going to listen to Waze. <laughs> well, I don't like Waze because. Google bought them, and so Google's actually a more reliable platform, yeah. and, it, and it uses Waze's uh, uh, shared data anyway. Okay. okay. So, you know, it's Waze is good to know what Okay. But, <laughs> but um, how is as, as part of your, your vision? Um, I'm going to ask the question and ask the second question as a follow-up. The first question is: Do you see accessibility to transit as a larger challenge than education on how to use the transit system effectively as the challenge to be, to be able to use it. Because I do think that if you use it more, it begins to justify we need more to taxpayers and everyone else, right? But then, and then as a follow-up to that, um, so like I grew up in Gardena, 
California, right, which is about 13 miles south of downtown. Gardena has this, we, we have a municipal bus service, Torrance has one. A lot of other, especially South Bay cities have municipal uh, transit lines. The challenge that I saw growing up was that I think when you look at the metro boards, it's a governance issue. The majority of the representation, the vocal representation of the metro board are LA city proper representatives and that's who LA Times covers. And so one would think that they have the biggest voice. And what ends up happening is that for someone like me, who was a kid, RTV at that time, it was very intimidating. It just, I mean, it was, it was intimidating. It was, it was literally called the rough, tough, and dirty. <laughs> Miles was not putting me on that. But then the local municipal agencies didn't do an effective job with young people on really educating on how it could really be a connector to the rest of LA County. You know what I mean? So I just think, so, 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 so then the question becomes, how is Metro working with the school district in order to change a lot of those attitudes, in order to really educate young people? Because otherwise, I can tell you right now, my kids are going to be using Uber and Lyft because it's just like, just that, it's the, it's the education barrier, especially, especially outside of LA proper to be able to use uh, mass transit. So. I know that's a lot. Thank you for listening. <laughs> no, it's okay. I'm, I'm a really good listener. Um, <laughs> so um, so I, I would say, I mean, it's not one or the other. And that, that is one of the hardest things for all of us to grapple with, which is that, you know, again, like, like I said earlier, there's no panacea for this. I mean, you can educate people as much as you want, but if you're not providing a service that people want to buy, then they're not going to write it. And so we have to do both. We have to educate people, but we also have to improve our services. And I, I want to be really clear about this because um, I know a lot of people, um, you know, get offended when I say we got to provide some things people want to buy. But you know, it's. I think that you know, it's not that we don't do well. I mean, we do about as well as we can with the current configuration of how we do business. Um, and. But we can do better, and I think we should always try to do better because you know I, I think we're sort of obligated to because we can't sit there and go oh gosh we're leaking ridership you know but but oh yeah you know our buses weren't running on time or you know but but making the buses run on time is not a, you know it's not solely the responsibility of our operations team we have to come up with different ways to make our buses on time and that includes sometimes taking a lane from a street um, and that's not a very popular thing to do. But, but it might be worth it because, you know, when we are carrying full buses of people, you know, those people deserve to have the same level of priority as if they were driving a car, right? So what would that priority look like? And, you know, this is something that, um, that uh, uh, the mayor of Bogota, what's his name? Enrico Peñalosa, he talks about this all the time, is that you, you, you know, if somebody, if, if you have a bus full of 40 or 50 people, they deserve more priority. And that's just, that to me is the fact. So we need to make that happen. Uh, so maybe just a comment about buses. There's MTA, there's a lot of new needs. And I've seen buses where MTA stops at a stop, at a bus stop and behind it is the new need. They stop at the same stop and they keep moving and they stop at the same stop. And sometimes maybe pay you or more, or the dash, right? Yeah. It seems like there's too many buses. To be honest, there's just too many buses, and I, I know there's also too many cars, but they can't exist at the same time. It's just too much. Maybe a vision 2028 would be less bus, more rail. Let's take out more. Let's take out some of these buses and save the money and build more rail. Has that been thought about? Or the buses are keeping keep increasing. You know, Measure M is building rail and we're spending more money on buses and more bus lines. Having dedicated lanes for buses can work on maybe a corridor like, you know, going up and down Broadway, or maybe, uh, you know, east-west on 7th Street. But you cannot do it in, you know, everywhere. So we can maybe take advantage of this off it in the main thoroughfare. <coughs> so maybe, I don't know, Vision 2028, an expert, maybe spend less money on buses and more on rail. Yeah, so I think um, <clears throat> in the example that you gave, which is you know a Muni and a Metro bus sort of following the same pattern, um, I think part of what's happening there is just the overlap of their routing system. And so one of the things that NextGen is looking at 
is where we do have some overlap and where we might be able to, you know, sort of, you know, if, if a muni is running, say, every 15 minutes and Metro runs every 30 minutes on this effectively the same route or in certain segments the same route, um, it doesn't really make a lot of sense for Metro to keep that route going um, because it's confusing for one thing, like, do you get on the Metro bus or do you get on the muni bus? Um, so the idea there is to, to say, okay, well, if this, is a, a, if this segment is a portion that a muni can be operating without Metro, perhaps the hours that we would use, the revenue service hours we would use on that segment could be reprogrammed to provide better service somewhere else. And so that's part of what NextGen is looking at. Um, I don't think that the answer is just more rail, because we can't rip out the entire county and put rail everywhere. That's just physically and financially not possible. And so we really need to leverage our bus system um, so that we can actually use it and provide many, many, many more rides. And so, you know, that doesn't mean we're going to have bus-only lanes everywhere. It means that where it makes sense on some of our busiest corridors, maybe those are um, the BRTs, you know, with exclusive lanes, and then everything else feeds into those, just like everything feeds into rail. Um, but, you know, obviously there are a lot of local services um, for the short trips that we were talking about. We need to provide the services for those short trips too. So there's different different levels of service that you have to provide depending on what kind of services you're running. Yes. I have to say this. The gentleman who was young man was just here, second ago in what you said. <clears throat> I'm 70 years old. And the individual that got me involved with transit was my grandmother. She took me. And she took my next door neighbor everywhere on Saturdays on buses. I remember you had a bus tote and it was almost like you had, you had the world in your hand. The one bus line, it's an RTD line, was the Wilshire line. She told me, that runs right because you don't have to run to catch it. Okay? So whatever it was, we used that Wilshire as the backbone to go different places. So it stuck. So as easy as it sounds, it might be as complicated as it can be. But 60 years ago, when a grandmother can tell you, you got a good line when you don't have to run to catch the bus. That's all I had to say. The gentleman that said that reminded me of her. Sounds like you're asking for more service on this show. Yes. Um, just a question about congestion pricing when you go back to buses. Um, as you spoke about the need for a robust community outreach effort, what type of feedback are you going to be seeking from the public? What, what kind of what kind of variables are going to be at play and up for discussion when it comes to the public feedback? Um, you know, I would say that um, I, I, I think that it's going to be hugely important to help the public understand the context of why we're even proposing to look at this. Um, because there's there's probably already people out there who are like they're imposing another tax on you and they're doing this and they're doing that and you're, they're just taking taking your money and they're they're hurting the poor and and all kinds of stuff like that which is the typical rhetoric that you hear from people who who don't believe that pricing is a mechanism to manage demand um, so I think in terms of what we're trying to get from the public or from that outreach it's more you know understanding we need people who understand the various communities that are out there because we, we're going to be talking about this with um, super rich communities as well as super poor communities and, and that's the reality of LA County and so we're, we're looking to, to help people understand how congestion pricing may or well how, how it will affect you know their trip um, whether they drive or they take transit or however it is that they travel um, there's there's a bigger story here than just about the price itself, and that's what people focus on. And I and if you followed any of the uh, the, the discussions with the Metro Board about congestion pricing, you know that equity was a huge piece of this. And you know it was like equity for low income drivers and equity for poor communities and equity you know like whatever you you know whatever you you want to say. I mean there's this huge question about equity, 
and not really much recognition that the current system is inequitable. Um, I think that's the primary thing that we have to remind people is that the way the system is now, it separates people from, or separates uh, uh, the community from people who have the means to drive and people who don't have the means to drive. And that is a huge divide right now and, and somehow we seem to think it's okay or at least better than the possibility of changing. And so we need to, we need to remind people of how the system works for people today because it doesn't really work that well. Yes? That's you. Yep. Yes. Uh, I, I live in Orange County and thankfully I have an 815 Amtrak. Um, but, <laughs> Um, and I, there's three projects in particular, well, there's four projects in particular that I think have a huge benefit to Orange County. Of LA, they're LA Metro projects. Well, one is kind of more near term, that's a no brainer, the Rosecrans Marquardt um, grade separation project, um, which will be on the line that I'm about to take back to Fullerton. But the Metro's um, light rail projects, the Gold Line extension to Whittier by the year 2057. The gold line extent, the green line extension of Norwalk in 2052, and the West Santa Ana branch to Arteta in 2041. This just dates from the OC Transit Vision from OCTA. Mm -hmm. All of those, well, the, even though the Norwalk one is not in Orange County, it's it would be of great benefit to people in Orange County to get off the train in Norwalk Santa Fe Springs. But the West Santa Ana branch, we're trying to build more political support. We're doing the whole West Santa Ana, the historic Pacific Electric right of way, and then. La Habra would be another Pacific Electric right away, you know, continuing all the way to Brea, really, from the Woody, this Gold Line Whittier extension. So, what in Orange County can we do to help LA Metro get those done before the 2050s <laughs> in, in Orange County? Uh, if you have money that you can bring to the table, that would be really, really helpful. Okay. But, um, right now, it's, it is an issue of money because. Um, if you followed Measure M, you know that in the ordinance there's a schedule for the projects. Um, if you follow the Metro Board uh, meetings, you also know that there was a push to accelerate a number of projects to be delivered by 2028. Um, Measure M has a number of uh, policies, cost containment policies, affordability policies, things like that that are attached to it that um, seem to be not as important as they used to be <laughs> to some of the board members. So, um, so we have, you know, there's. Uh, there's a push to accelerate uh, from a cash flow perspective. Obviously, we can't really afford to accelerate projects the way people want us to, but if money came to the table, uh, there would probably be a different discussion. Um, but I don't know how it is in Orange County. We'll try to get the money for you. Okay, all right. Yes. Also, you know what? You, you already had a question, so uh, let me. Go. Okay. <laughs> uh, rail systems work better when you know, you've come, come from quite a distance because it's value to free travel. Uh, one of the biggest problems which I see happening is getting to the station, the first mile, last mile, mile kind of issue. And then very often, uh, some of our employees have to go travel backwards to find a parking spot and get a seat on the train. Plus, uh, our rail system works as a spoken wheel system, like everything comes towards downtown, though so not all the employment centers are in downtown. And, and uh, for instance, I'll give you an example. Mm -hmm. To get to work from Pasadena to Burbank, you, know, you still have to take a train to downtown to get there. Um, or go from Pasadena to Montebello to Long Beach, you know, you name it. Is there a way of maybe making a ring service of network of buses, which can be a lot more efficient, uh, to be later converted into a rail system or something as time comes and money comes in? Yeah, that is part of the purpose of the next gen study is to take the data that we have on travel patterns as they were today and figure out how to configure a, a bus network that actually addresses those travel patterns. Um, you know, as much as we may think that, and, and I'm just going to use this pretend example, but you know, maybe people who are in Burbank, uh, we think they might travel to downtown or they might travel to um, you know Santa Monica or whatever. I don't know what the percentage breakdown is of the number of trips that we see from day to day to those locations from Burbank, um, but you know it might be less than what we thought. <laughs> and so if it is less than what we thought, maybe maybe it's less important to have a specific 
route that runs those to you know to those particular origins and destinations. But maybe it's more efficient for us to run to you know a rail line or something um, that's not too out of direction in order to get people to their destination. But but that's where the the, the big cell phone data is so helpful because um, a lot of that cell phone data is collected very passively and it tells us a lot about where people are going and, and you know like where they're starting, where they're ending. Um, you know, how long they're there sometimes, I don't know. I, it has all kinds of information that I think is really interesting and relevant. But we didn't have all this before, you know, before cell phones. So it's kind of exciting to see how things are changing. And I'm, I'm really interested to see how this uh, cell phone data changes how we do travel demand modeling in the future. The employment centers are changing every day now. Yeah, you know, that's one of the things about LA, LA County, is that, you know, we have a very decentralized, housing pattern here, which is, uh, I guess, sometimes good and sometimes bad, but it's, it makes it very difficult to, to plan transportation. <laughs> yes? Yes, yeah, so just to touch on kind of maybe a related point, um, what, you, I think you mentioned at the top on, on some of the initial points how broadly the, the term technology is really kind of changing how things are happening and how, um, you know, it's changing things in ways that none of us anticipated five years ago, ten years ago. What, um, you know, not to discount the investment in the capital side of things, but I think technology is one of the areas that are, you can do faster than a construction project, for example. And what is kind of the value, or what are, just what are your thoughts on, on the importance of technology and, and the information and data sets that are out there and, and how we give a priorities at, to Metro in terms of this, you know, meeting the Vision 2028 and, and priorities to general for the organization? Well, I mean, I think the application of technology over all facets of our business is really, it's really powerful. Because um, everything from, everything from, you know, the travel demand that we're talking about um, throughout some of our conversations here to, you know, collecting data on the performance of our, you know, our equipment or infrastructure, particularly our buses and trains. Um, you know, nowadays, you know, there's computers on every train and every bus that tell us, you know, when the, you know, fuel pumps going bad or something like that, whatever. I mean, I'm making that up because I don't really know what's on the bus. But, um, <laughs> but you know, it's, it, that kind of information is really, really powerful, um, particularly as you know, we talked a little bit about continuous improvement and performance measurement. And I think, um, you know, when we talk about system reliability and, and being able to run our system efficiently, we need to know, you know, how to, you know, how to do sort of like conditions-based <coughs> asset management, um, which that's where, where data sets can be very powerful as well. Um, in addition to that, I mean, I think, um, you know, getting feedback from customers, um, some of the crowdsourcing that Waze is actually so famous for, and MoveIt as well, um, you know, being able to collect data from our customers in real time um, will help us understand where some of our problems are at. Uh, this, is, this is all really great stuff to talk about, really hard to implement, particularly in, particularly in a 11,000 person bureaucracy. Um, but I think having people within our organization who can who, who understand the value of that data and, and how that data could be used. I and mean, we can collect all kinds of data at Metro. Do we use it? Not always. Probably so, not even to its size. Yeah, it's not to not to project, but I think that's usually the most the problem about them is they have this information, but they don't have yeah. to use it or have it. Yeah, it's a capacity problem. I mean, you know, a data scientist is very hard to come by. Yeah. But, you know, we can also, you know, if we get a really good data scientist who can train, you know, some of our planners and analysts, you know, maybe we can figure out how to fulfill that need, but um, we have to first see the value of that. Yes? Uh, yes, I'd like to talk about the old-fashioned bus stop. Uh, microtransit, like Lyft and Uber, is diverting ridership uh, from the LA Metro system. It's also diverting some ridership from, uh, uh, from private. Uh, uh, tri private automobiles, and this is going to increase. Okay, that's uh, probably a good thing. There is still the the, the old-fashioned bus stop. Uh, LA Metro has on all of its routes. It has about 12,000 12, bus stops. They don't control any of them. The city, starting with the city of Los Angeles, controls the bus stops. And I think they're, we're overlooking the ridership experience and not improving the environment of the bus stops. What are we talking about? Well, ideally, the 12,000 bus stops, uh, we all have a shelter. That's not going to happen. There isn't physically room for a shelter. 
uh, in near the Trump change of location. But there is room for more shelters than we have now. How does it happen? We have to work with the cities. Okay. Now, some of the bus stops uh, have lighting, and that's nice. If, we, if, there's, if there's not enough room for a shelter, at least a concrete seat or, or a metal seat. That's better than having nothing. Not that you're going to have 100% of the 12,000. Also, some of the bus stops now, and I'm told it's, it's going to gradually increase, they have electronic uh, real-time information. You push a button, and it tells you when the next scheduled buses are coming. And there's a little light that flashes on. Now, these are happening, but more can happen if uh, we find the funding and if we work with the city, starting with the city of Los Angeles, to improve the environment of the old-fashioned bus stop. That's a great comment. And um, I thought I, I saw an article not that long ago about a bus stop in East LA where an artist had just built a bench there out of plywood or something. Yeah. And he just did this, you know, in, in, installation on his own because they needed a seat and they didn't have one before. But um, yeah, that's, uh, it, it's going to be a work in progress. And um, I don't know what to tell you other than you're right. <laughs> I know you had a question. Yeah. Um, so I, I've lived in LA for a very long time and I know that it's typically pretty hard to get change to happen in LA, um, particularly um, with Metro's experience in Beverly Hills with the Purple Line, um, and also with LADOC's experience with building those bike lanes and you know doing those road diets. Um, people can be very litigious, especially wealthy people. Um, and I love the idea of congestion pricing, and I love the idea of bus lanes everywhere. Um, but are there any lessons learned that you think that could change the way that the public reacts, particularly the more wealthy public reacts to um, what Metro does? Lessons learned. Um, I mean, I think we have to be ready to to talk to people and listen to them. Um, there, there's, there's always, gonna, there are always going to be haters, um, and and that's the reality. I mean, you know, in, in U.S. society, I think when you have money, you have voice, and um, you know, I think that that's something that we have to be very, very mindful of and very aware of. And um, you know, I think that you know, in terms of lessons learned, I don't know that there, you know, we're sort of in uncharted territory. Uh, we can look to, in, in terms of congestion pricing, we can look to places like Stockholm where they implemented the pilot for, what, six to nine months and then had the voters vote on it and the voters decided to keep it. Um, but, you know, data doesn't always matter, you know, when somebody's really feeling like they're uh, being disparaged or, um, you know, marginalized, um, whether you're rich or poor. Um, you know, so, you know, it's not always a logical discussion that you have, and so, um, you know, all we can do, I think, is just say, you know, here's our goal, and our goal is not necessarily, you know, just implementing a congestion pricing pilot. Our goal is to improve mobility. Our goal is to make LA a better place. Our goal is much bigger than, than ourselves, and so that's really, I think, why, um, you know, I think we're sort of in a different time. I mean, the fact that the board, the Metro board unanimously voted to study congestion is pretty crazy, you know, and we had board members actually coming out with statements at the board meeting saying, we need to study this. Um, and I sort of joked, you know, because right around the time that we were doing this, New York decided that they were going to study congestion pricing. I was like, oh, they only did that because we were saying we were going to do it. You know, because in reality, like, they've studied it for years, or they've talked about studying it for years, and they hadn't, you know, they hadn't moved on it. And then all of a sudden, mm -hmm. LA's like starting to talk about it, and they're like, oh yeah, yeah, we're gonna do it, you know? So, <laughs> so I'm kind of like, yeah, we kind of, you know, if nothing else, we push New York to do it. <laughs> They've always been jealous of our weather. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's so funny, it's like, now, now that I'm in LA, I realize how much New York hates LA. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah, I, my question is, uh, seems like uh, in general public, in Los Angeles metropolitan area, Many people just don't think about using public transportation. But then I visit a like, large metropolitan area like Seoul, Korea, or Tokyo. Uh, I find it the easiest and most reliable to take a uh, train, uh, subway. 
and LA, uh, America is the most productive. LA is like a prosperous community, and still uh, we are not to that amount, that degree of like convenience in mass transport. So it uh, seems like uh, what I feel is we are uh, LA Metro is going for somewhat uh, less expensive solution by making bus line more more convenient and better customer experience. But uh, in the long run, even though it might be slow, is it is the need better or like more like sustainable to have major heavy lifting by rail system and supplement that by uh, bus system. Uh, especially when LA population keeps growing, 10 million to 11 million in 10 years. So more dense. So we will have more people living here. So my question is whether LA Metro has studied other big metropolitan area they, where they have most of people moved by trans, uh, mass uh, public transportation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, a number of people who work at Metro are fairly well traveled around the world. Um, you know, I, I actually participated in a study mission that went to Southeast Asia to look at actually performance measurement and how it was used to improve operations and customer experience. But in the process of doing that, you know, I was in Hong Kong, Taipei, Kuala Lumpur, and um, Singapore, and so I got to see you know exactly how these systems were being run and it's pretty mind-blowing when you go to Asia in particular. I always tell people that Asia makes Europe look like it's standing still. And so um, so when you go there and you're, you're in Hong Kong where they're running a train every you know three to four minutes you know and they're all full it, you know you start to think okay what what are they doing differently you know and, and there's there are a lot of things that they do differently but they also um, sort of coupled with the provision of really great high quality transit services either bus or rail they also severely limit parking, and they severely limit the use of roadways. Um, when I was in Hong Kong, what they said was, you know, we can't, you know, we can't uh, move, we can't, we can't keep building roads because we don't have <coughs> space for it because it's an island, right? Um, and it's really mountainous. And they said, you know, we want to preserve our our street capacity for goods movement because we can move people by transit. And so that was their entire philosophy on how they were going to actually move. Um, move people, and that's why we're building so much or making so much investment in their in their uh, passenger mobility system. So you know, we just don't have that same. You know, like we build out, we keep building out. I mean, look at LA. Like, how long does it take for you to like when you get over the mountains? You know, it, you're flying forever before you finally get to LAX, and it's this crazy thing that you know I didn't really fully understand until I moved here. Um, but you know. I, I haven't quite figured out why in LA it's acceptable to travel two hours each direction for work. Um, I never thought that that was really acceptable, but um, somehow people um, are willing to give up their time um, instead in, in the interest of saving money. And, and that's one of the things that we talk about a lot with the congestion pricing and stuff is that, you know, you're paying right now. You're paying with your time. You can pay with your money in the future. Um, and you might have a better trip and you might save some time, but you know that that debate is is a very personal one That's a, it's a personal decision and so we want to give people the option to make that choice um, If you know obviously if we have to deal with equity and stuff like that too, but um, but you know people don't recognize that right now They're paying with the time and so you know it's a fundamental thing that I think we need to get people to understand Yes I was living and working in London 2002, and that's 2001 to 2003. That's when the mayor at the time, Ken Livingstone, was talking about instituting congestion charging. They called it there. And uh, I was living in the center when it started. And it was very successful. There were a lot of worries. A lot of trepidation it was very successful, meaning the terrible congestion in the center of London was dramatically reduced from the beginning. And 
that had various knock-on effects. But, for example, <coughs> if you wanted to take a taxi to get through central London, which in London the black cabs are everywhere, in <coughs> Manhattan the yellow cabs, much faster. Everybody was very happy. The cabbies were happy, which is hard to make them happy about anything. So the politicians benefited from that. Also, people who had to drive were able to get there much faster. So this is more of a comment to you and others at Metro, is to emphasize if you have to use a car or if you ride a bus, congestion charging will reduce congestion dramatically right from the start. It was reduced by 20% on day one, immediately. The other thing they did, so that drew a lot of people to support it, as happened to Berlin and Stockholm. The other thing they did, which was wise for the uh, transit agency, the Metro has to keep in mind, is as would happen here, I think, the money from the charges were plowed back into public transit. They prepared ahead of time. So they didn't start taking the money and two years later show something for it. They put new buses on the streets within a month of starting the congestion charging. The frequency increased, the timeliness was much better, and there were these bright, shiny new, of course there are their double-decker red buses right from the beginning. And that brought people on board very quickly too because they saw the benefit of the funds, even though they, they London Transport had to pre prepare ahead of time. But Metro would be wise to learn from their experience. Absolutely. I, I actually forgot to mention, because a lot of times when we talk congestion pricing, I think people think we're going to flip a switch and the next day some area of the county is going to just be priced. Um, but really in the whole feasibility study and the planning of a congestion pricing pilot, there's a whole component of that study that has to look at the transit, um, transit service that has to be implemented in order to do congestion pricing. Because you really can't do congestion pricing if you don't have a, a good alternative for people. And so um, the congestion pricing study will look at that and they will, like depending on the locations, they will look at how much uh, transit investment needs to be uh, made in order to provide that option for people. So. That needs to be done ahead of time. Absolutely. Yeah, I sort of joke with people. I'm like, well, okay, do you want bus only lanes or do you want congestion pricing? You know, like <laughs> you can have one or the other, or maybe you have to have both. But, you know, let's start with bus only lanes. I think that's a little bit less controversial than congestion pricing. I might be wrong. Yes. You mentioned one of, one of your measures of accessibility was a 10 minute walking distance. Uh, I wonder how many blocks uh, you generally think that is and how it fits into the first and last mile uh, planning uh, calculations. Yeah, I think generally in, in planner speak, 10 minute walk is around half a mile. Uh, that's usually what we use. Um, but uh, so half a mile would be what? Four blocks, depending on where you are, because some blocks are shorter and some are longer. Um, but yeah, in terms of like first and last mile, I mean, you know, we talk about the 10 minute walker roll. I mean, when I think first and last mile, I'm thinking I don't want to walk a mile to my transit. And so um, even half a mile sometimes, you know, on a bad day, I just don't feel like doing it, right? Um, so the whole idea is really making it convenient so it doesn't seem like, you know, a long trek to get to your, uh, to your service. So um, having, having options, um, you know, I think at one time we looked at Uber trips. Um, I think it was when we were doing the Uber Expo experiment for like six weeks after the Expo line opened. We had a deal where people could get a discounted Uber fare <laughs> to one of the Expo line stations. And um, I think we learned then that like the average length of an Uber trip was about six miles. So, you know, it's not really the first last mile, it's more like the first last six miles. You know, and, and that's, you know, like if you're doing six miles, that's, you know, that's a pretty long way to get to a station way out of the way to get to your station. So I think um, you know we need to look at the data to figure out how far people are willing to travel. You know, because I, I don't know what the, the quarter mile or half mile radius was that planners generally use to figure out the walk shed or the ride shed, but I don't know 
I, I don't know where that came from. I don't know how we established half mile or a quarter mile um, as threshold. But, um, but I think now that we have cell phone data and things like that, we have a much better uh, way to figure out what the actual distance is that people are willing to walk or, or ride to get to a station. So another place where we can use data. I think we're probably wrapping up, right? <laughs> I mean, I don't mean to keep you here. I actually was supposed to go to a class at 8 o'clock when I was listening. So um, anyway, that's OK. But thank you so much. This was really fun for me. I really enjoyed talking to you. Thank you. Thank you. I want to thank you.